Welcome to The Pestle, reviewing and breaking down movies to look for insights into the movie making process. Hosted by The Dollar Menu. Nothing says bargain like chemicals pretending to be food. Now let's dim the lights and start the show. Welcome everybody to The Pestle. Today's show is brought to you by Crisp Denim. Look sharp in our high-waisted 70s inspired jeans. Don't dress like a Neanderthal, dress crisp. Welcome everybody to The Pestle. I am Wes. And I am Todd. And we're filmmakers, writers, actors, all the things. Uh, We bring all of that knowledge and experience of things we have learned on other sets as we look at films and see what we can learn or take away. Um, I do this every week, you know, for a lot of reasons, one of which is to talk movies with my best friend. Uh, That's never not going to be fun. Um, But also, I for my whole life, I know everyone, you know, to some degree or another, uh, well, most people deal with imposter syndrome, right? This whole idea that you don't know what you're doing, you know, uh, is ever, is everyone going to find out that I'm making it up on the fly, right? Everyone kind of deals with that, especially you get a new job. Um, and you're like, why do they hire me? I don't understand any of this. I mean, to, to one degree or another, no one knows what they're doing on any job, you know, the first two weeks. Um, and then you're expected to learn. They will teach you what you need to know if you have the basic skill set. Uh, that's that's all that's really required. Um, and so, yeah, I have that. Everyone has that. I get it. Uh, I I also have a thing where my entire life I've always felt imposter syndrome about everything, just about life itself. I've always felt like everyone around me knew a secret that I didn't know, and they're all having a conversation that I couldn't quite understand. Um, and so, I've always kind of dealt with feeling dumb <laughs> like I, I i have i i'm not a, a complete dummy but i do struggle with like my comprehension skills like i read a lot of books and they're all difficult for me because i you know i think we all have those moments where you read a page or you read a paragraph and your mind was somewhere else you don't know what you just read uh, and so you have to reread it and of course you do that once, you're probably gonna do that five times. That page is now going to be forever. Like I'm going to get through this page and I'm going to understand it and I'm going to pay attention this time. Um, we all kind of have that thing. I also have a thing where I'm reading and I'm focused and I just didn't understand what the hell, what, you know, was just read or, uh, what was spoken to me. If you give me directions, God help us all. Uh, it's not going to end well. <laughs> um, I, and it's been that way, I think, you know, for, for everything. Um, I've always struggled to really uh, be a part of the conversation. So I can be a bit of a wallflower. Um, I, I pick up on emotions very, very easily. Um, I pick up on information very, very poorly. And so I do a lot of memorizing in my life. I might memorize a sentence um, that has a complicated word, even if I understand that word. I still might need because the sentence runs too long. I might need to like break that sentence out into an even longer sentence. So, you know, uh, forlorn, right. Or, uh, uh serene, uh, the, the Creek was serene. And then I, it's like, okay, wait, the, the Creek was serene. And so I have to say, I can't say serene in my head. I have to say calm and peaceful. The Creek was calm and peaceful. Okay. I get what this, you know, the, now the sentence needs to be probably like five times, you know, three or four times bigger than that, uh, than just like three words. But I do that a lot in my head where I'm reading a book and it has this, a word and, and that's combining it with another word. And suddenly I'm freaking lost. And so I have to start extrapolating and like making it bigger, but more bite-sized at the same time. And then I can understand like, Oh, I get it now. Um, all that to say, that is kind of why I do what I do. It's not because I don't do every episode, man, where I'm like, I'm going to show everybody how smart I am. That's not, I know I probably come off as pretentious a, a time or two or, a, or 50, uh, but I, that's not actually what's happening. I'm actually struggling in day-to-day life to understand things. And so what I can do though, is I can take notes. I can teach myself a thing. And this show allows me to kind of just formalize it and speak on what I've learned out of my ignorance. I'm literally doing every episode to teach myself stuff. Um, It's not because I want to show how smart I am and I'm going to educate the audience. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, you know, some of that's a byproduct, at least, uh, you know, making other people understand, demystifying certain aspects of filmmaking that I do understand, that I do have a pretty good grasp on. Uh, But there's also a lot of 
Wes is trying to understand something and he's, and this is just a good way for me to uh, put it to words and to say it out loud, you know, to maybe have it punched a hole in by you or affirmed also by you. Uh, <laughs> you know, those, it's a good dialogue. It's a good way for me to uh, feel like I, I understand filmmaking a little bit better. I understand this movie a little bit better. Um, and I feel less dumb now that I can actually sit digest it, take a note and they are, Oh, okay. I feel a little less lost in the world. The same exact reason I memorized every country, every flag, every, you know, national capital, uh, just so that I could shrink the world because again, I'm really bad with geography and directions. And so I do these things as a way to shrink everything down to a size that I can now tackle. Yeah. That's, That's amazing. I'm glad you said that. Be- <laughs> yeah, no, no. I'm, I'm really glad you said that. I think too many times, not just in podcasts, but just in 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 everything where people are are providing information or pro- providing some kind of like um, um, review of something, it's kind of taken um, it's kind of taken as as oh this person knows what they're talking about, and and I think it's important to note that like look Siskel and Ebert, yes, they are professionals of what were professionals of what they did, and um, and. You know, most reviewers, I think, you know, are, but at the same time, they're also learning just like you are. And they're also, you know, when they see something for the first time on film, they're as in awe as you are, or as, as our listeners are, you know, and, and they ask the same questions. How did they do that? You know, and they might be able to come up with an answer quicker because they've seen more Mm. films in, you know, like that, like, you know, the second long shot in this film, uh, which I I hope we spend the entirety of this time talking about. Um, it's amazing. I just, you know, I sit there and I watch and I think, how do they do that? And I think that obviously, you know, uh, uh, Steven Spielberg would have ideas of how he would do that, you know, mm. um, but he doesn't know exactly how they did that. You know, he wasn't there on set. Uh, so it's it's all learning for everyone all the time. And I think it's important to, to note that. So thank you for noting that, man. Agreed. Very cool. Thank you. So what shots, uh, in what movie are we, are we tackling? (laughs) Yeah. So today we're covering children of men. I think it's 2006. It came out. Um, uh, and, uh, so yeah, if you haven't seen it, please pause this episode, go watch it. I don't think it's streaming as you mentioned, looked it up and didn't, didn't see it, but it's, it's worth the little bit of money it would cost to rent for sure. For sure. Uh, yeah, we'll look at a few things. Uh, some of the cinematography, it's hard to escape that in this movie. Um, I know it's been discussed a thousand times in other blogs and video essays probably and uh, casual conversation like this movie has been picked apart. And so uh, we'll certainly touch on that. Um, we'll look at some of the ways that they're immersing the audience um, they being, I guess, Alfonso Cuaron and Emmanuel Lubezki. But uh, yeah, so we'll touch on that. We'll look at some of the story and writing, the real genre that I think we're in. Um, we'll see who are the good guys um, and other such stuff and things and stuff. And uh, already mentioned the spoiler alert. So the synopsis gives a little bit of that away. So if you haven't paused, uh, pause now. Uh, in t- uh, 2027, a chaotic world in which women have become infertile, a former active a former activist agrees to help transport a miraculously pre- pregnant woman to a sanctuary at sea. It's directed by Alfonso Cuaron, uh, based on the novel by P.D. James, cinematography by Emmanuel Lebeski, featuring Clive Owen as Theo, Michael Caine as Jasper, Julianne Moore as Julian, uh, Chuetel Ejiofor as Luke, Claire Hope Ashti as Key, Peter Mullen as Sid, and Oana Pelia as Marichka. So... You've got faith over here, right? A chance over there. Like yin and yang. Sort of, yeah. Oh, Shiva and Shakti. Lennon and McCartney. Well, <laughs> Look, Julian and Theo. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Julian and Theo met among a million protesters in a rally by chance. But they were there because of what they believed in, in the first place, their faith. They wanted to change the world, and their faith kept them together. But by chance... Dylan was born. This is him? Yeah, that's him. He'd, he'd have been about your age. Magical child. Beautiful. Their faith 
put in praxis. Praxis is what happened. <laughs> Charts. It was a sweet little dream he had. <laughs> little hands, little legs, little feet. Little lungs. In 2008, along came the flu pandemic. And then by chance, it was gone. Oh, Jesus. <sighs> you see, Theo's faith lost out to chance. So, why bother if life's going to make its own choices? <laughs> <laughs> Watch her. Baby's got Theo's eyes. Yeah. Oh, God. That's terrible. But, you know, everything happens for a reason. That I don't. But Theo and Julian would always bring me luck. So, I assume you've seen this before. I, I, I also assume it's been a while. Um, and I don't know if you're aware of this, Todd, but in the interim, probably you've had a couple kids. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm curious, yeah. I guess. Uh, I didn't realize this was 2006 until I went to watch it. Um, in my head, this is only like seven or eight years old. <laughs> um, you know, not feels 15. like it. And um, so does it still resonate? Uh, did it take you a while to get into it? Um, and more importantly, like, uh, has your feeling shifted, do you think, uh, as you've evolved in life? Uh, yeah, I, I can't remember the last time I've seen it. I, I, I've seen it probably three or four times now. So not like, you know, a bunch of times, but at, at least three times. Um, and I don't necessarily know that having kids has changed my view of it. I mean, mm. uh, it may be of that scene, you know, mm. um, where it either talks about faith and chance and how chance can give you a child and take it away. And that's very true. It can, you know, give you a family and take it away, give you life and take it away. You yourself. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I, I get that. I think that I, I honestly think that doing this podcast has changed my view of this movie more than anything else. <laughs> you know, it's just, it is a literal masterclass of how to make a movie great. You know, um, you have this almost dystopian future, um, in, in, and, and yet you have this miracle that needs to be protected by someone who didn't care about it in the first place. Right. So it's like something that, that has been done before, I guess, like the concept of that, of that layout has been done before. Um, but, but, you know, making it, making it like a, a, a fertility thing. So like the future of the human race is, is at stake, um, because of this thing that has been lost to us. Um, and I think that a lot of that has been done before, but the, the, the cinematography, I mean, obviously the one, the wonders that we're going to talk about are, are just like, I, <laughs> lack of a better term, the best I've ever seen. Like, I, I don't, I have never seen wonders as perfect and flawless and unnoticeable as, the, as in this film. Um, but the acting too, like, like Michael Caine in that scene it's just so, he's just so perfect in all the scenes he's in. He's so perfect. I mean, it's funny because Michael Caine is one of those actors where, let me turn on this light. I don't know if that does anything, but yeah. Michael Caine is one of those actors that he kind of plays the same thing every single time. He's just, he's like, he's Arthur, you know, like <laughs> in every single movie, right? And you just love him and he's, he's fantastic. Um, but for some reason, I think it's, the decision to give him long hair and be a little bit more like hippie, whatever, you just love him even more. And, and the way he delivers th this line of like leaning forward and then like, ah, uh, leaning back, I've just laid some information on you. And, you know, like, like, you know, he almost like he's teaching you is, is this kind of a little bit of a different way, uh, a, a different kind of performance for him. The whole pull my finger thing. It's, it's just beautiful. And so, and so we have this kind of uh, almost um, comedy relief in him, which is desired and needed. And, and we feel like they're getting a respite in this, this moment of going to him, right? After he's, he's saved her from that, from the place. And then 
he, that he's like, I know where to go and they go to him. So we feel this respite as a viewer. And then, and then obviously that goes to shit, but, mm. but as a, as a film itself, I think that the, the stakes are, are massive. They're, they're possible as well. It's not like a thing where, um, it's, this is an impossible future that probably, you know, could never happen. Oh, I mean, you know, in some, in some way this possibly could happen. And what would it, what would that future look like? Okay. Let's paint that. Um, but it doesn't feel like, like we're told the world is, is infernal, but we don't, like I mentioned in the, in, uh, you know, our last, um, uh, interstellar episode, you know, we have this feeling of the world, but we're not shown the whole world because there's no way that our brain could, <coughs> could really take all that in, right? We're, mm. we live with these people and we stay with these people and we feel it, we feel it. And we're taken on these rides with, with these people. There are hiccups. I feel his losing his shoes is a incredible little thing that is, that nags at you the entire time. He's constantly limping, limping and stepping on things and like hurting his feet or his ankles or whatever. He has flip flops on half like some at one point and you can hear the flopping of his feet while he's walking. Like it's just these little things that, that, you know, oh, and the car, you know, when he, when they're, he's taking her away from that place, they're like sneaking out and he unhooks the car batteries and stuff. And he gets in his car and his car won't start because he has to push it. It's so stressful. They can't just like drive away quickly. He's got to push through and then he's got to get out of the car twice to push it again. And it, all of these things, these little things that make it where if you don't really want this, it's easy to say, oh shit, well, we tried, hmm. but he just never quits. He just never stops. When she gets taken away at the end, you know, it's easy to say she got taken you know, no, he goes after her. He throws himself into the, into the, the war zone. I think the storytelling is fantastic. The way they pick the moments for the, the wonders is fantastic. The acting is fantastic. The cinematography is fantastic. I think the colors are amazing. Uh, the, the, the color grading on this is so wonderful from this shot where we have the lush browns and, uh, um, uh, these these yellow hues from the light, like the, the practical on the floor, um, to the lighting outside the window, uh, it's just it's it's really really wonderfully done in every way. This is gotta be up there in I don't know my top twenty for sure. Maybe maybe even higher. It's just so good. Yeah, and then you get to the end of the film, right, where where uh, everything's muddy, everything's washed out. Uh, and desaturated and it's grim right Every, it, there's all this haze in the air um and so you can't even see the sky right it's this overcast blown out sky uh, and you can just kind of start to feel more and more of the hopelessness we have that peaceful moment of reprieve uh with jasper before it all gets stripped away right and yeah i love what you're saying even just about michael kane's performance like uh, his character, uh, Jasper has it, that silly, silly bit, right? Pull my finger like, and it's so appropriate because that's, that's a gag that dads and grandfathers do with kids, you know, and he's still trying to be a, a dad. He's still trying to be a grandfather in a world without children. Um, and it's just vestige, right. Of, of everything. And it's an interesting movie. I, I would love to say this is exactly, I, I have the answer. I figured it out. You know, it's in the second scene. This is what this movie's really about. I have no idea. Uh, to me, um, it feels like, I don't know, repudiation maybe of everyone and of everything. <laughs> like it feels uh, like everyone's getting the business on, in this film, um, you know, on a philosophical level anyway. Uh, but I love that the, the why is not only never, answered we never know why you know we women become in, infertile um and they never try to answer it i love that so much because that's not what this movie is about and i get very frustrated when a movie makes it or, or a tv show um uh, asks a question and has all their care all these characters spending time trying to answer that question and you never get an answer to it 
Um, that to me is very terrible writing and lazy writing, uh, as opposed to this, that is creating a scenario and they never stop to ask why, uh, the most you get is in a joke. It's that that's really about as close as you ever get is this joke that Jasper tells, um, about, you know, the, the people who all come together, right. And, um, all the top scientists in the human project are staying, sitting around dinner, right. And, uh, they, they don't know what it is, right. Um, I forget what he says, like environmental, it could be, you know, uh, chemical, it could be gamma rays, pollution and so on. No, no one has any idea. And they ask, you know, whoever, I forget who the, the, the main character in the punchline is, and they ask him, he's like, I have no idea, but the stork is quite tasty. <laughs> <laughs> He's eating the fucking stork. He's eating the stork. <laughs> yeah. And I love that because it's it's making sure the audience knows that this is not what this movie is about. It's not about answering the why. Because if you answer the why, that's a judgment. Now you're pointing mm -hmm. out, you know, it's pollution. And pollution is because of, you know, the way we're treating our planet. It's possible. You know, it's also possible is science, right? Genetic experiments that that's now invoking the idea that maybe we did it to ourselves through another more sophisticated element. Um, or it could just be nature, right? Gamma rays. That's nothing anyone could ever have any control over. And so he's pointing out that it's we don't know. That's not the point. That's not the reason. The real question is what happens to people when this happens or if this were to happen. Um, yes. And by posing that question and giving us a scenario, uh, it really starts to illuminate and, and bring about all kinds of ideas and, and thoughts about humanity uh, and just how attached and how, you know, precious that as a, as a culture, as a world, we view children. Um, and, and it's, it, I find that incredibly fascinating to say that if you remove children from the equation, all of society melts down um, and we suddenly go to war over each other the 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 whole feeling of a uh, purpose is stripped away because you know that's where humankind really gets its purpose is in kids um and it's so easy to say that humanity is selfish everyone is greedy and and self-serving um but i love that this film kind of paints a different scenario it's saying that you know, if you don't have kids, you know, uh, to pass on your legacy to and to create a future for suddenly you yourself, you know, have no purpose. There's nothing greedy or selfish about that, you know, in a very literal sense, uh, because if it, if you no longer had that responsibility, why wouldn't you just live for you and live for today and just everything's good. Everything's OK. Like it's all about whatever sex, drugs, rock and roll. It's all about me and, you know, getting the most satisfaction. I, instead, he painted a picture where everything was doom and gloom. Um, you ripped away our future, you know, suddenly there was nothing else to live for. Not even you, not even your, you know, you know, selfish desires. Uh, and I, I just love that because I think that's uh, an incredibly accurate picture of humanity. Whenever you think about who we are, not just as a society um, today, but uh, throughout history, like yeah. it's always been about the next generation. And it always will be about the next generation. Um, and then the irony, I think, that he kind of points at is, you know, you remove kids and uh, you add kids back into this equation. And as Theo points out, we've already screwed ourselves. It, everything We've already destroyed everything. We've destroyed each other. We've destroyed civilization. Um, and so it, it starts to paint a much more complicated picture when you start adding kids back into that equation. Uh, because now you're saying... Well, you you destroyed yourselves because you didn't have a future. Um, but if you give yourself a future back, you're not giving a future to anyone now. Um, you have to find some kind of, uh, uh, you know, synthesis that allows you to have both things. You can't keep destroying yourself and expect to have a future to pass on. Um, those two things do not cooperate. And so you can just extrapolate a lot of interesting philosophy um, about, you know, the modern culture, modern world, how we treat each other, how we treat the planet and how we, um, how, you know, we use science to, to do whatever. Um, it's, it's very fascinating and invites a lot of uh, interesting introspection um, and, and conversation, I think. Yeah. I'm great. I mean, great points, uh, honestly. And it's, it's funny, uh, just as a side, an aside, um, 
I haven't, uh, musically, I haven't written much lately, mm-hmm. but I watched this movie and yesterday I wrote a song and I wasn't connecting them at all, at all. But the, cool. this, it, while I was doing it at all until you just said this and, and I was thinking about, it, I was like, I, I wrote this song and it's called to love someone. And it's, it's about, it's about loving someone else more than what you want. Right. And sacrificing everything and not ever regretting it like one time. And which is literally what, <laughs> you know, like, like what you're talking about. It's like, mm. you know, uh, uh, like living for someone else at some point, you know, like making that decision of a transition from being, being, you know, all about you and your, your goal for happiness or what you're looking for in your life to about something or someone else and how that actually you know, in Clive Owen's character, you know, was exactly what he wanted and needed, right? Like, I think, I think uh, he went from this, you know, cynical character who used to be an activist, but has let that go because he's seen that, you know, there's, it's not going to do anything to now being more than willing to sacrifice himself um, fearlessly. Fe- I mean, no regret, right? At the end, there's yeah. no regret. Not at all. I mean, he, and it, and I love his death scene too because it wasn't drawn out. It was it was he he got her to the exact position that she needed to be in, and then he just went, right? And he, I mean, the way that death scenes are so funny because nor like unless they're done perfectly, they're cheesy as shit. They're just they don't work, and they never cut away from him. It's just they stay on him and he he's he starts breathing a little heavier or whatever, and then he just goes. And you believe it. You 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 know, anyway, any I and but he there was never, like you said, any kind of regret or like wishing that it he hadn't gotten shot, even. He's just like, here it is. This is it, you know, like boom. So Yeah, and I love the way he reveals it is because she sees the blood and she's freaked out that, you know, yeah. she's bleeding again. Um he's like he's reassuring her. It's not like, Oh no, they got me. It's like, Oh, it's, it's okay. It's just me. Yeah. He got me, you know, and that's it. Yeah. He's not, yeah. he's not upset about it. That's crazy. <laughs> I know. I know. And, and, um, and you see the moment when it happens too. Mm-hmm. And, but he doesn't flinch. He doesn't have, uh, you know, like say, Oh, or, or anything like that. It's because it happens at the same time as an explosion. And so you're, you're thinking, Maybe he didn't shoot him because then they he gets up and they, they just walk out. And by the way, the best moment in the entire movie for me, and I don't know about for you, but I, I'm curious as to what yours is. I really am. I really am. But for me was when everyone realizes that there's a baby there and they stop, stop shooting. They stop shooting. Not yet. Not yet. They stop shooting. They walk out of the building and at that moment, there is silence. There is peace. And then there's one shot and everyone instantly goes back to what they were doing. Like they completely forgot there is a, the last child on earth, like the, the first child in 18 years on earth, 20 feet away from me. No, I'm going to be, I'm going to keep shooting everybody now. It's, it was a, a moment of respite of, of like almost awe of, I can't believe this. And then it was just completely lost in an instant and they didn't have to do that in the film they could have just left it they could have walked away and just left it you know like like silent in the in the place that totally would have worked but they made a statement quran made a statement saying of 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 i don't even i don't even know what it was of just uh, <laughs> of like a like i guess the shortness of our attention spans maybe mm-hmm. i don't know of our focus of our uh, uh of our the the purpose we set, I'm not sure, but it was just an incredible moment that I completely forgot about until I watched it again. So anyway. Yeah. yeah I mean, that whole sequence leading up to that moment, um, it's like the six minute one or where yeah. we start all together, you know, she gets taken away um, and he goes to invade the building and suddenly there's tanks and their tanks are firing, tanks are exploding and buildings are exploding. Like, that's a crazy, crazy one. I remember still the feeling I got in the theater 
once I realized we hadn't cut in a while, um, I was just like, my mind started melting. I was like, what is happening? Now we're in the building and now we're and it's interesting in that sequence. He never picks up a gun. Like he never looks to join the fight. It's always just about finishing his goal. Like I'm just here. I'm not a threat. You know, I'm here to get her and get out. Um, and even whenever he finally gets face to face with Luke, um, he never looks to, to take him out first. Um, the closest he ever gets right is, uh, I don't know, a cinder block or a battery or something that he picks up and smashes uh, Sid in the face. Um, yeah. And that's just pure necessity. Um, and yeah, I, I, that's just an interesting little wrinkle. Um, this shoeless guy is looking to survive um, and and save, you know, the future of humanity. Uh, but imagine without, if he, without violence. Ima- yeah, exactly. Imagine if he wasn't shoeless, though. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's just such a tiny little thing, <laughs> but it's just a little added difficult wrinkle that it, is put on him. Uh, it's It makes it so much more amazing. Yeah, for whatever because, reason. because this whole movie, right, there's really no good guys. I mean, we it, this yeah. film takes aim at everyone, right? The government sucks, right? They The, the military is attacking a refugee camp and is going to level it. Um, and the government even makes their citizens look like prisoners, right? We're, we're hanging out with Theo and he's just taking a bus and we feel like we're in a prison. Um, and you know, there's a newspaper articles like they, the, the MI5 tortured a photojournalist, um, and they're, or at least they're accused of it, which is, uh, the implication is probably enough to assume guilt, um, on their part. Um, and, or, you know, the fishes you know initially it's like oh is this our is this our group we can get behind right uh this terrorist group maybe they're the the quote-unquote good guys uh because look they're fighting for equal rights for every immigrant in britain all the refugees right they're trying to so maybe you know we're going to paint these as our 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 heroes uh but they're not they're they're not good guys right they murdered their leader they're trying to kill theo um and kidnap key and her her baby uh for their own agenda to help fight the government that's that's their big goal is um you know the the war has already begun and they haven't even seen the baby yet right this is our our spade this is our secret weapon um and we can get whatever we want uh by brandishing like baby diego's dead now we have a new hope kind of thing um and so the the fish is not good which the that they termed them the fishes is really interesting um i never got a sense of religion out of them but uh fish usually has a strong correlation to christianity um but religion aren't heroes either islam uh doesn't seem to be they don't like beat them into the the ground um but early in the film after the the bomb explodes in the the cafe um they're jasper and theo are talking like who do you think it was I don't know, Islam, the fishes, doesn't matter. Like, uh, uh, so they clearly think either, all of those are interchangeable. Um, and, you know, Christians know better. Um, science seems to be failing everyone, as we said earlier. Um, and But there are these rare and random people that are good, right? Julian, clearly a force for good. Jasper, I mean, pull my finger. No one who says pull my finger can possibly be evil. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? They're the most evil. <laughs> right. That's, that's chaotic evil. Yes. Um, and you have uh, Marika, um, you, you, who is this random good person, right? She's actually looking to help. She doesn't save herself, right? She sends Key and, and Theo off on her boat um, to, to go to tomorrow. And she doesn't look to go. Uh, and Marika's interesting. I, I hear America whenever I keep hearing her name. Um, and so to me on maybe a level, uh, one could argue, um, that Marika maybe represents America, uh, in our earliest glory in, in some sense, right? There's, there's no perfect moment of America and throughout history, but in the, in the early founding of America, you could think of us as refugees, right? Um, from, from Britain. And therefore we took in other refugees and right. We're a melting pot nation of immigrants, um, Marika, the, the character takes Theo and key into her home 
um, and these Russian refugees uh, take them in and clothe them, right? He finally gets shoes. It's these other, uh, you know, struggling refugees who give something finally to Theo selflessly. They do nothing for themselves. They just give food. And so you had these refugees who um, are, are, are kind of this rare silver lining of hope and, and goodness in the world. Um, and then Theo himself, right? Theo is a good guy. Um, even though he's maybe lost his way, we find out towards the beginning. He's an interesting character. Um, his name is interesting. Theo is the Greek root word for God. Um, uh, but it's also, uh, I had to look this up. This isn't like top of the top of the yeah, head, top of West knowledge. Uh, but it, it, it's apparently also Germanic for uh, people or folk. Um, and so you could look at him as kind of the, the general spirit of humanity um, and having lost its way. Right. Uh, and he's in that clip that we heard from Jasper. He's telling the backstory of Theo. That's all exposition for Theo. And um, he's talking about how Theo has lost his faith um, due to random chance. Uh, and so this movie is about Theo regaining his faith. Right. His goodness, um, the, the spirit of God and the people kind of finally finding its way again. Um, and he's he's an interesting person, right? He's he went from this activist, right, um, who had hope and had a kid, uh, lost his kid, lost his purpose and his faith. Um, and he becomes a smoker, this drinker. He's gambling. He has a job he could not care less about. He has this terrible apartment, right? Um, and so we're painting this really interesting uh, picture of a guy who's lost his way and has come back. Um, and that is the people. Yeah. And so maybe there's not a good group of people, but and this maybe is a little <laughs> easy for my worldview, <laughs> but uh, the goodness is in the individual. Like it's, it's specific people. It's finding uh, goodness in individuals, not in groups uh, that I think, you know, is the the realness of humanity yeah i don't know that i've ever found uh an entire group of people who are amazing right? i love that that may oh my gosh that makes me so happy to hear you say that because i didn't know that i was i wasn't sure either but that makes complete sense in fact i i anytime there's a group of people saying something i don't listen <laughs> right i listen less right because i I'm, i subscribe the same as you yeah. of like groups have alternate all motive have ulterior motives yeah but an individual while they might have ulterior motives usually is just voicing their you know their own what they subscribe to themselves right it's just it's just it's just different right they yeah. have their their own interests at heart rather than than a group who is also influencing them as an individual so i wow very good point i didn't think about and so I guess we can dive a little bit into cinematography because Ooh, I don't have a ton here. Like I just feel like I wasn't going to add anything to the conversation. And so I didn't spend a ton of time looking or at least taking notes. I, I definitely spent a lot of time looking and not blinking <laughs> while <laughs> watching this thing. Well, well I, I mean, I have questions. I don't know if maybe you have answers. So yeah, well, well, okay. The first one, the very first one is, is that the second long oneer in the car mm. how the hell i mean we're okay at first i thought because i watched it three times and at first i thought maybe the actors are are handing off the camera but mm. there's a couple of shots where i see all five of them in the shot and then it it'll but then it goes back into uh you know like uh, into like a seat in the back seat where we see um uh, uh theo and uh, and, and they're spitting the, the the ping pong ball back at each other and it's just moving around all over the place. But there's a, there are a couple of shots where I think maybe they handed it off to an actor. How did they do that? And if you don't know how they did that, how would you have done that? So luckily I do know um, because I've seen this BTS about a thousand times. It's a, This is one of those shots that cinematographers freaked out on when it came out. And then as soon as the uh, the magician revealed his cards, um, everyone shared it and everyone uh, keeps bringing it up uh, like it's the, you know, the brand new thing. Um, and so it's been beaten into my head um, cool. without like me trying. And so it's they basically uh, 
cut a hole in the top of the roof to drop the camera and mount the camera to it. And so they did a lot of like green screen replacement kind of stuff to, you know, in post to patch the ceiling up. Yeah. Um, and so now because of that, you can move the camera up and down, um, and pan it, you know, left or right. The, I forget how exactly they did the in shot though, because it ends with, uh, the cam op pulling the camera out of the car. Um, yeah. and so I assume they maybe hit someone along the, the side of the road who walks up to the car and, you know, dismounts it from the, from the grip, um, grip head. And so, yeah, that's, it's an incredible shot though. I mean, it's worth the goo goo gaga. Like what did I just witness? Um, because it's relentless. It's whatever, you know, four minute shot or so. Um, and you are just pulled in and they have this burning car all of a sudden and you know people running out of the woods and uh someone gets shot in the face or you know like it's just uh and anytime they they like towards the end they have that shot where he goes goes into the bus and blood spatters the the the, the camera though that stuff is so immersive and cool and it's um really useful um, yeah. And so it was mostly that they do a, a fair amount of CG, like that, that ping pong ball is CG. Um, yeah. and oh, yeah. it's a little easier to spot now than it was opening night, you know, 2006. Um, but it's still solid. Um, and the performances are good. And that's kind of the cool thing too, is it's, I'm sure gobs and gobs of rehearsal. Um, I would imagine they sat in, you know, some studio, uh, parking lot you know with uh, uh them all sitting in a car working through the scene working through the blocking um 50 times uh but everyone in there is just phenomenal because this whole film really takes advantage and that's Koran. like more and more he's gravitated to these longer takes immersive right uh this film and uh, I think really goes into the documentary style handheld, right? We're going to make you feel present. Um, and those long takes really begin to immerse you in the scene. But, and they, they set that in that first opening, right? Whenever uh, Theo goes and gets coffee, um, that's a really long one or that ends with a bomb exploding out of the same sh uh, coffee shop that we just walked out of. Like, yeah. That's a way to start a movie because now yeah, no cuts, no, no cuts. cuts. You were just there. You yeah. were just there. And now there's a woman missing an arm, um, screaming, um, hard cut, right. As she lets out her, her last scream. Um, and it just, it pulls you in. You have our attention, uh, because we never expected that, you know, uh, that an explosion was going to happen there, uh, from this peaceful cafe we were just in because most films that do these big explosions, there's a setup like we cut to this nice wide shot so that, you know, we can get a nice, good, clean look at this explosion. Uh, we didn't spend, you know, $150,000 blowing this building up uh, just so that, you know, you missed it. <laughs> like, uh, so as a as an audience, we've been trained to spot the big moments. And whenever you suddenly pull this card in 2006, we no longer know where safety lies because uh you've upset all of our expectations and everything we thought we knew about being an audience member uh brilliant brilliant in stuff the, in the the car scene were they actually driving the car or was that all green screen outside the outside uh they were driving that car yeah that they was were all so Joyville was driving that mm. okay. i was it, i can't remember was if he remote? was actually driving or if they were on a rig, rig? Um, okay but it, i imagine there was a rig like uh where you have a driver sitting on top of him who's actually controlling the car. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I would yeah, imagine yeah. that was probably it. Um, yeah. Okay. Those things are really crazy and it always blows my mind what they're able to do. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, it, the, the, the one or at the end, the long one, um, how much of that was CG? Because I'm real, I'm, I would like to say that I'm pretty good at spotting CG, uh, you know, like, Especially from 2006, I think I can, I think I can do a pretty good job. I don't think I can get it all, um, you know. But w the more there is, obviously, the easier there is to spot. And because that that sh the stuff that shot, especially when he's getting to the building and the tank is blowing up sides of the building, I feel like there's enough CG to where I would notice that that is how much of that was. I don't think that much was CG. 
um, to your credit. Me either. And so yeah. I think it was all like enhancements, right? The bullets obviously mm -hmm. are CG, um, yeah. but the explosions are probably 80, 90% real. Um, and they're, and it has to be real in order to get the way the light gets occluded, you know, um, around him and he walks through it. Like I would imagine that's a heavy amount of actual practical effects. Um, and Koran is also strikes me as that nutty, right? Like we're going to do this. We're going to do this for the next 10 days until we get it right. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. And so uh, that, that's my feeling. Okay. Mine too. But I don't and that know. Makes me yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that, but that makes me think like, if that's the case and it and it wasn't as much CG, did they have one take to do that? Because they were literally blowing up sides of this building. Or did they like fix it, you know, and then and then and then okay, let's do a second take. You know, it's gonna take us a week to put this building back together and then we'll do another one. Like in my mind, if if the way I just assume, um, and I'll look this up and add it to the show notes just so that um if I can find it, you know, what actually happened, I would assume that's the kind of thing you get maybe one a day. You get that. You can do this take. Um, we'll, we'll rehearse it, you know, um, and then we'll get it because there's also, it, it felt like it was also staged around the day, uh, the sun. Um, yeah. and it's an early sunrise kind of moment. And so I assume it's, it's, you know, timed around that. Um, though it is also, uh, and it's London, or I assume they were shooting in, you know, England somewhere. Uh, and so the there's a lot of fog. Um, and I bet that's the kind of thing that dissipates as the day goes on. So if you want to shoot in that nice fog, you want to shoot earlier in the day um, and or whenever it is there. Um, and so I think, yeah, they have these false walls that they've constructed and, um, you know, with all of these fake bricks and we're going to shoot out. 50 pounds of sand and uh yeah it's very much a you know red team go kind of situation <laughs> but it's okay. incredible i mean the the timing the staging i bet if this is a, a 70 million dollar movie i bet this is two million dollars of of stuff happening um because you have to either build or find the right set to to shoot all this on because you're walking through the set it's incredible. Like you're moving between all these buildings um, and then you're bringing in these tanks and uh, you, then you're going up the like all that's real stuff. And so, yeah, you, you, you're you going to pay for that. Like if you want to be able to go between whatever, two or three blocks worth of buildings um, and then also have a couple blocks in the depth, you know, you know, sitting behind that to create a sense of scale like that's you're you're paying for that. Right, man. Um, yeah. yeah. And so that's my feeling is you get one a day, maybe two a day, uh, if things go right. Um, th otherwise the, the reset is just going to take too long, but maybe not. Maybe they found a way that, Hey, uh, we can get two in the morning, two in the evening. And that's, that's what we get. Cause there are some hard cuts. Once you get to the end, once he finally gets to Luke, there's finally some cuts and the rest of that sequence has a bunch of cuts. Um, and so maybe it's, we get our one big take and then we're going to get, you know, now we can spend the rest of the day getting our pickups and we can shoot this scene, shoot that scene. And then we take the rest of the day off and we'll do it all again tomorrow. Um, yeah. Wow. But yeah, it's incredible. nice. Just yeah. Because mind boggling, honestly. It really is. They, the, the way he shot this invites a lot of that immersion um, because there's a ton of wide shots with really deep depth of field. Uh, the aspect ratio supports it so that you can see a lot of the world. Um, and we're, we're not quite at 69, just slightly wider, uh, but they're using a lot of the sensor um, so that you can see everything. You never feel uh, disconnected from your environment. The environment plays a massive, massive role psychologically in this film. Um, and so the way you shoot that really goes hand in hand uh, with that because we're not spending a lot of time in people's emotions. Uh, we're spending a lot of time in the physicality of the world and how people are interacting with each other, not necessarily in what people are feeling. Um, and so because of that, we don't do a ton of close-ups, not a lot of long lenses. Um, instead, let's go wide all the time. It's very theatric in that way. And it's, it pays dividends, my God. Yeah. But also a lot of set deck, right? A lot of set design that 
you can't just go wide and not fill up that world full of stuff, right? Graffiti everywhere, um, billboards, signs, that stuff is expensive, right? Uh, and it all reinforces the, the, the world building, right? The suspicious report all illegal immigrants, right? Um, and fertility is God's punishment. All these protester signs, repent, repent, repent. Last, my favorite thing in the film is something like last one alive, turn out the lights. <laughs> like, holy crap. <laughs> that's dark. <laughs> it's so dark. And yet that's going to happen, yep. right? Yep. That's expected to happen at some point. It feels very Banksy. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, I, I also love the little added, um, the, the, what baby, what's his name? Uh, the, baby Diego. Baby Diego. I love that. Like, they, yeah. you know, to identify there is a, to actually identify there is a youngest human being on earth all makes it even more real, you know, rather than just saying, okay, women can't have babies anymore. Okay. I, I, I get that. That does suck. That's awful. And that means the end of the world or that. Yeah. And, and if humanity, um, but then to see, Oh, there is a youngest person. Oh, now he's dead. So now there's another younger, the youngest person, but he didn't just die you know, an accident, he was killed, you know, oh, this is a violent world where. And know, I love yeah. it because it also feeds right into like the growing uh, fascination with celebrity, with fame, because baby Diego is just famous for being born. Like, um, and you got, you could just through that little bit of exposition, get the sense that he was sick of it. Like he was just trying to be. Um, and the reason he died was because he spat in the face of a fan. And then a brawl broke out and he died as a result of that. Um, and so it's a lot of interesting dynamics going on about the world that we live in um, and that we're passing on to, you know, kids. Uh, yeah. It's very, very fascinating. Um, my last notes are about uh, what kind of subgenre or genre uh, that this movie is. And to me, this is a road trip movie. Um, and it sounds, <laughs> oh, yeah, it sounds hilarious uh, because I think it is kind of hilarious to frame it that way. Uh, but it is because if the basic tenet of a road trip movie is you're trying to get from point A to point B and there's all these hiccups along the way. Right. Uh, that's that's it. Every road trip movie is only ever about that. Now, the why, uh, you know, is often uh, you're trying to get a package from this place to that place or there's something at this place that we really, really want, right? The, the pot at the end of the rainbow, right? We're, we're, we we got to find the end of that rainbow. Uh, and so this is just a road trip movie. Um, and because of that, you have to make us earn it. It can't be as easy as going from A to B, right? We need to construct uh, things, blocks, you know, roadblocks, barriers uh, to make it more interesting, right? And so we go through betrayals, right? Luke betrays Julian, Sid betrays Jasper and Theo. Um, they're being chased, right? And so in that sense, it's a, it's a chase movie. Um, but that's not what actually propels, you know, them at the beginning. Um, and so therefore I don't call it a road trip movie. Most road trip movies have chase sequences in them. Um, and so being chased adds a sense of urgency and suspense, right? You have to watch your back now. Um, and now we have to make sure we keep moving lest we get caught. Um, and of course you got to have transportation problems, right? you have to have problems accessing this or that and the other thing. And so the car won't start. You talked about that really amazing sequence whenever, uh, he's just trying to, they're, they're trying to get away from the farm. Right. And there's so much tension just through trying to start a car. Uh, and it doesn't feel gratuitous. Like at no point do I question it because the world is so degraded. It makes total sense that this crappy beat up car will not start and that they have to get a jump start. And it's even better that it doesn't work on the first try, right? They get momentum, they get going downhill and boom, and instead of starting, it stops. And now we have to get momentum again because there's 50 people chasing us with guns and they all want to kill Theo. <laughs> uh, and it's just so good um, to, to get your blood going. And, um, and of course, he needs a password to meet Sid. And the password is given by this hippie, like, pull my finger jokester, right? You're a fascist pig. <laughs> like what? worst password in the world when you're meeting a cop. Um, and this is 
because you don't know. And so instead of just like, oh yeah, you're right, that's the password, let's go. Like you have this uh, fascist cop who's being a complete wad and he walks up, say it again, say it, I dare you, right? Breaks out his billy club and he's about to beat him to a pulp. We don't know. They could have just made that, you know, quick, yeah, let's go. Instead, you make us earn every moment, make us question every moment. Are we in the right place with the right people? Um, that's the only way to make a road trip movie work is to make every step in that trip um, wrought with problems and potential pitfalls. Um, and so in that same vein, right, we have the conversation about mirrors, uh, which is an interesting you know, idea because Theo's like, what are you talking about mirrors? And she tells him, look, contact is only made by one person through a network of people. Julian was the only person with indirect contact with the human project. And Theo's starting to lose it um, because he's like, wait, we have no way to talk to the human project. And so he's invoking the idea that after we get through all this stuff that we're going to have to go through, we don't know if they're going to be there. We have no way to expect what's going to happen at the rendezvous uh, because we have no way of knowing if we're on time or to, to let them know, hey, we're running five minutes late. <laughs> like they don't know what to expect. And so they do a good job of setting up or at least trying to set up. Um, we don't know what's going to happen once we get through all the muck in the mud uh, that we're going to have to fight through. It's fantastic. Like uh, at the heart of this movie, it's very simple of just going from A to B. Uh, and instead of making it that simple, every step along the way, even as even as shoe transportation, like uh, it doesn't have anything going for it. <laughs> like mm -hmm. he has no footwear. Uh, and so in every way, they make sure to throw up a barrier, uh, a barricade, a barrier, whatever it takes to to make this more interesting. Every moment is earned. Yeah, can't. I mean, I, yeah, <laughs> totally, totally. I mean, the the shoe thing. It's all about the little things. I feel like, especially yeah. in this movie, like I mentioned before, and you just said the shoe thing is perfect. You you take something that should be expected, and you remove it, right? <laughs> and it, when you when you have when you go on a road trip, you need to bring your shoes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and it, but they. They, and they really do a perfect job of addressing it when he wakes up early in the morning to the, you know, the, the guy riding his motorcycle in and, and when he steps out of the house, he steps into mud. We pan down to see he doesn't have shoes on and he's stepped in his socks in mud. Mm. That's how we're introduced to the fact that he doesn't have shoes. Is that like we, cause he wakes up and we see him fully clothed. So we think, oh, of course he's, I mean, you're not thinking, but. You imagine, of course, he's got his shoes on. But no, we have to introduce, we have to show that he doesn't have any on. And that's how they introduce that. And they never show any other shoes. So then later on, when he's there's this pile of shoes, also you're thinking, what the hell? And then, oh, the only ones that fit are flip-flops. Okay, so we're going to give him something, but not enough, right? We're gonna, <laughs> it's, it's so perfect. It is, especially that's such a visceral moment. We all know how wet sock feels, and it's the worst right? oh i had that i had that reaction too like oh, oh i would turn around and go back inside <laughs> right. i gotta get my like, shoes i would rather lose a finger than deal with wet sock for a day <laughs> like, yeah <it's> so bad. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, yeah i love that um yeah i i don't know there's all these other little moments they they're constantly fleshing out the world like there's a moment in the refugee camp when it looks like they're like barbecuing people um that feels impolite uh and <laughs> the the camp itself is made up of everyone i love that it's not just one type of people it's everyone in the world there's like french refugees it looks like there's saudis uh and in the beginning of the towards the beginning of the film we see that everyone is falling right there's a thousand day siege on seattle um, and so the entire world is just filled up with chaos and hopelessness um, and so you really begin to feel the importance of, uh, you know, where do we go from here? And so uh, I love that the boat is tomorrow, right? The whole whole goal is to get to tomorrow. <laughs> That's what we're fighting for now. Um, and getting to tomorrow is the world's worst journey. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's it. In a nutshell. <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty good nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh what, man. What uh yeah, any last thoughts? That's I'm <sighs> I mean, I just want to keep I just want to keep talking about these winners really. I, so I, one other thing that I wanted to to actually just maybe I don't know, bring up and, and talk about it was the positioning of them. Mm. Right? I think that it's it it's also really smart. Not not only do you, you know, if you want to do s- oneers there there has to be a purpose behind it right uh, like and like you mentioned earlier it's perfect for for making you feel like you're part of like you're you're there you're immersed in it you know and i think that more than more than any of the others really um it's a great setup at the very beginning to have it be that explosion cuz you were just there and because you don't cut you feel like oh my gosh i just missed out dying um just like he feels and that's so the positioning was you know, I think there's, I mean, there might be more than this, but there were three really, really big ones, right? There was the one at the beginning, the car one, which is maybe halfway through. Mm. And there's the one at the end, um, uh, in the, in the city. Uh, so I don't know how you feel about that, the positioning, the purpose of it, of them and, and how that has to play into film to writing the film. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, because that opening is so incredibly important on setting tone, expectations, um, and removing that sense of safety uh, because, you know, there's no traditional cuts and edits are a way to relax an audience sometimes. Now you can do a ton of edits and that heightens everything because now you can't blink because you might miss something. You might miss a shot. Um, So a lot of edits can exhaust the audience but no edits can also equally exhaust the audience because, you know, if you have five second cut here and a five second cut there, it's like blinking, right? We never keep our eyes open all day long, right? We blink thousands of times, whatever, a minute or whatever, like you're just constantly blinking and it's a little bit of a reprieve. And so nicely timed edits are a reprieve to the audience and removing those um, can suddenly pull you in. Um, and for them, I think the timing thing that you're talking about is dead on because it happened in the beginning. Um, and then throughout the film, yeah, they have these longer cuts, uh, but nothing that we would probably start to label one or territory, right? He's on the bus, um, towards the beginning as he's driving out to, to Jasper's and we kind of hang out. We, we pan around the, the bus and look out the window before kind of landing on him. Uh, and we hang out there for a moment, but it's not incredibly complex, um, we're, we're, we're looking around, we're experiencing the world, um, before we finally cut to meeting Jasper. Uh, and it's not until that big sequence of the car ride where at a certain point you realize we're not cutting. Um, and it's right about the time whenever the, the flaming car comes out of the woods, uh, which is probably a really fun thing to write on paper. Um, and, but they set it up really nicely too, because that's right when Julian's about to die. Uh, and, they have this little cutesy moment, uh, which I'm sure was a writing headache. Like, how do we make them, how do we make the audience like Julian? Because they're lightly building an expectation of a reuniting of Theo and Julian, right? She kisses them after their first meeting. Um, and, you know, so he's asking questions about what about us? What happens with us? And so they're trying to create a sense of expectation of a future of them together. Uh, and then in the car ride, they're doing this ping pong gag, uh, which I'm sure was a thing that was derived out of necessity. How do we create a moment between them when they're not next to each other? Um, and how do we do it in a way that includes the car? Um, because we need her in the front seat because Luke is setting her up to die. Um, we can't put her in the back seat or else we're taking too many gambles, too many risks uh, for Luke. Luke wouldn't risk uh, key getting shot, right? Instead, let's put Theo behind her and hey, maybe there's a two for one um with that bullet. Uh, instead, it's very carefully orchestrated by him. Um, and let's c- try to create some emotional expectation with Julian. And oh, crap, she's dead. That's Julianne Moore. And now she's dead. Uh, we don't know what's happening next. Um, and then of course, you know, we run through a bunch of scenarios after that. I mean, that whole sequence with the cops uh, was was pretty wild whenever he guns them down in the road because you're I'm thinking the first time, like, how are they going to get out of this? Uh, what are the cops going to do? Are the cops going to be on their side? Nope, we're we're not on their side, actually. Um, we're going to smoke them and roll out. Uh, and so 
there's a lot of heavy stuff that I think that's going on there. And the, the way they set up that final tank sequence, um, was oh my gosh great because we go from that safety of uh, the russian house and to this cave right we're in this entrance uh this big whatever stone archway uh and we have these stabby strings that come out of nowhere and you're you feel it it just invokes tension from the very first frame like hey audience guess what <laughs> uh and everything goes wrong um and it is so nicely done because it, it gives you a sense of uh, it, obviously the lack of cutting pulls you in um, and it takes your breath away. It's kind of like underwater sequences in that way. I think we all experience a moment of we're not breathing because the characters aren't breathing whenever we're suddenly submerged. Um, and this those long takes uh, have that same effect. Um, we're suddenly realizing we can't look away because we don't know what's going to happen next. The camera keeps moving around. Um, our character is about to get shot in the head. Um, and I love the way they set that up. He's super cocky um, and he shoots the, the whoever that guy was um, at the end. Uh, and that bullet invites more bullets. He started that. I love that. It doesn't feel like, you know, this deus ex machina moment where, Oh, soldiers are coming to the rescue. Instead, someone just heard this mofo fire a bullet. And now they're like, oh, here's our bad guy. Let's open up mm -hmm. fire on him. Um, it just feels endemic to the world. It doesn't feel uh, written badly. Right. Um, and from there, in that moment on, uh, it's lack of safety uh, and exposure and like these nice CGI bullets popping off everywhere. God, I don't know. The timing just felt amazing just to wait um because i think there's that part of us that just keeps waiting for more bad stuff to happen right sid attacking um and betraying them uh the the whole birth sequence that was a bit of a wonder um because yeah. they just kind of magic that baby out of nowhere <laughs> <laughs> i that was the other the other thing too was i was sitting there wondering like how and i've seen this before but how are you going to get a baby it, like, cause she goes into labor pretty, pretty quickly. You know, they get on the bus and all of a sudden her water breaks. Like, and you're thinking, and I remember thinking that has to be the absolute worst feeling. Imagine, imagine this, imagine you have to go number two and you're on a bus in a, pri you're on a prison bus, right? But no one can know, <laughs> right? But you have to go really, really bad, like worse than you've ever had to go. That has to be literally the worst feeling. Uh, I'm just saying that for men because how could we ever possibly understand right. what women go through yeah. in labor? But like we understand that. Um, uh, and, and I felt that. I felt that for her. Like, oh yeah. my gosh, how one, how do you, you know, mitigate that feeling uh, enough to stay kind of normal? And then two, what do you do after the baby comes? Like, how do you keep it quiet? Her or him quiet? you know, I, no idea. And it was perfect. The, they, they just do a wonderful job. Quran does a wonderful job of introducing a new character for a purpose. Yeah. Right. Every character that's introduced here, um, throughout, cause we, we meet new people throughout the film, which maybe is a testament to the road trip yeah. suggestion, yeah. right? <laughs> we meet new people throughout the film for a purpose, uh, uh, Marika was unbelievable. Uh, like, you know, cause at first you meet her and you're thinking, oh, she's so annoying. Leave, you know, like, uh, what's her she going to do if she finds this baby? Yes. It's, it, and then, and then, and then the moment she sees the baby, she even pushes the dog out of the way. Yeah. She's like, get out of here, you know? And, and you're thinking, okay, she just wants the baby, but no, she, we realize we learn throughout that. No, she is going to be the one to save them. Like he, they needed a boat. She, she got them a boat. She got them to this, to this safe house with these people. She got them the boat. Um, uh, she, yeah, she did everything. And then she let them go and didn't cause, and, and I was sitting there thinking the whole, you know, Oh, there's room on the door. 
Like there's room on the boat. Why didn't she get in? But then late, it was so perfect because later on you're, you're sitting there watching the boat rocking in this, what is pretty, seems pretty obvious to be open ocean. I mean, it was not, it was not, you know, like unsteady. It was mm -hmm. very rocking and she might've sunk the boat. It was, there was water getting in the boat, the lapping into the boat at some points. And I was, I was thinking, when you add another 120 pounds to that boat, it's going to sink another four in five inches. Eventually that would take on too much water. So it, yeah, she was very smart and, and sacrificing. And they test her too. They test the, uh, her motives pretty quickly with the baby whenever they're trying to get out of the door and key hands Marika the, yes. the baby. And you have that heartbeat moment, like, uh, and you see the panic and key take over like, cause Marika disappears around the corner and you're suddenly like, wait, no, 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 no. Uh, and you feel that panic and she comes back of course. And she helps. Yes. You're like, oh, okay. Oh, that, th that was such <laughs> an amazing, that those are the little things that I'm yeah. talking about. That was the great point. I felt that too viscerally in my heart. I said, I said, no, don't give her the baby. Don't get, but she had to, because she might've died and she had to ha at least do something. So such a wonderful position to put your your characters in and and to prove a character right? absolutely and yeah everyone's performance is just amazing in this even sid right you just love to hate that guy he's such a yeah. weirdo um uh, in, you you really need to put some of those characters a little over the top uh right he's he's just, just he's a terrible cop immigration refugee officer or whatever soldier um and he does that thing you need to look sad right mm, sad. yeah mm. oh yeah good that's job. good <laughs> <laughs> i noticed that too so good like he's a really good actor and it's just yeah. easy to hate him uh for for what he's doing there which you know just reinforces how talented he is yeah. um yeah i think just the use of all these wide shots and it's tricky because you have to really do a, a a careful job of how you stage all those because it's not like there are no edits within scenes right those wonders make sense as a wide um but if it's not a wonder and you're getting coverage in a scene um you have to be very careful where you where you're leaving a cut and starting a cut or else it's going to start to look jumpy and you're going to start to feel the filmmaking a little too much um and so you you have to really say okay we're going to leave this shot here we're going to get the coverage from over here on this other side of the room. And that way uh, you're being very, very safe about not making the, the viewer invoke the, the filmmaking. Instead, yeah. you're pulling them deeper into the story. And so you have to think about how you're shooting it and how it's going to fit into the edit, right? Shoot for the edit um, so that you don't abs ad accidentally, you know, rub the viewer the wrong way. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I can talk about this film Dude, all day but we got to stop at some point freaking it's incredible. beautiful beautiful definitely my top 20 for sure if not higher yeah god it's yeah. i'm just i just can't believe how well it holds up like it for one this is a movie released in 2006 that could have been made in 2020 <laughs> like, yeah agreed agreed <laughs> outrageous outrageous yeah. quaron is a master of his craft yeah. um nice what uh what are you going to recommend this week so yeah, this one was a little hard for me. I was thinking to, you know, cause I love dystopian movies. I, yeah. I just, they, I don't know. They just tug at the heartstrings. Um, uh, so I'm, this one isn't really, uh, I guess it's a little dystopian, but it's, it's fun. It's more of a fun dystopian than, than like children of men, which is not fun at all. There's not much fun about that movie. Um, uh, I'm going to recommend minority report which is Steven Spielberg, which we're going into a Spielberg September at some point soon. Uh, so um, uh, jump on that train a little bit. And it was made before Children of Men, I think. Uh, yeah, this 02. is 2000. Yeah, 2002, 02. 2001, somewhere in there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I haven't seen it in a while, but I remember really enjoying it. And, and you know, I just, I just love Tom Cruise. I love everything he does pretty much. I think he's, he's really good. And uh, it's one of those Spielberg films that I that i enjoyed it's a great popcorn film nice well done yeah. yeah 2002 um okay you are correct and so nice i'm gonna recommend a little indie film called watcher it's uh starring micah monroe if you remember watching it follows um 
and also has Carl, uh, what's his name? Carl Glussman, um, uh, who was in devs. Uh, and so I'm really enjoying watching him. Uh, but also Micah Monroe, I think she's incredibly talented and, you know, really un- underutilized right now. And so I was really excited to see her. I just saw that she was in a film and I was like, okay, I'm gonna go check this out. Um, and it's fantastic. It's very small, uh, little genre film. Um, written and direct uh written and directed i guess by chloe okuno um and it's about uh this couple who moved to somewhere uh, romania um and she thinks she's being followed or and, and spied on um by someone across the street and so it's dealing with a lot of stuff that if you watched men alex garland's last film um it's dealing with a lot of the same subject matter i think it does a far superior job uh to to men um and very much worth the watch i think chloe okuno is wildly talented uh because it's such a small simple film and she absolutely kills it i think those those movies are are the hardest to do to some degree it's easy to make like a superhero film right you know if you have the it's all about the big set pieces and the explosions and you can kind of escape some of the the drama and the story through the big action sequences a small film where it's just about people way harder because now you have to get people interested in who these people are and what are they thinking how are they feeling how are they perceiving the world how is the world perceiving them? Like there's so much more dynamic stuff happening there. Um, and it's so much more intimate. I think it's just so much harder to accomplish. And so I was really, really thrilled with Watcher um, and took notes uh, for sure. Uh, Chloe Okuno, I am looking forward to whatever else she has coming out. And so Watcher, go check that out. If it's not playing, it'll probably be streaming for rental or maybe on a platform here pretty soon. Yeah, I loved it. So check that out and stay tuned for next week. We are going to be taking a look at uh, another. We have some foreign films coming up. Uh, The first of which is Pan's Labyrinth. Guillermo del Toro, uh, arguably one of his better films. Um, And we'll get into that (laughs) next week. I'm really excited. That's one of my favorites personally. Um, And yeah, so Stay tuned for that. And if you're enjoying the show, don't forget, subscribe, drop us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to our show. Thank you for listening. And don't be afraid to leave us a note if there's something you want us to talk about or a film you want us to cover. Big shout out to Seth. This was a request from him. I hope you enjoyed this episode, my friend. Um, And if you want to comment on this episode, you can do that at thepestlepodcast.com slash children of men. And our quote of the day is from Alfonso Cuaron. And I, I wonder if this quote came before or after he did Same. Children Same. of Men. That was the first thing I thought of when, when I read it. I was like, I wonder if he acted, if he directed this way for the mil- film or after. Uh, okay. I used to be very controlling with visuals and editing, and I would pretty much craft the performances. Now I have learned to trust the material and the actors. Uh... Yeah, this probably came after Children of Men. I can't imagine him not fully controlling all of that stuff, right? I will say it's so much. I was impressed watching this. uh, I watched this twice. Last night I watched it just to watch it um, and watch it again this morning to take notes. And so last night I was watching and I was like, man, this is an aggressive film in so many ways. Obviously, the action comes right to you, but also in terms of exposition. Like he's punching you in the face with exposition. There's not a lot of clever exposition in this film. It's all very direct. Um, And I think it's easy to do that when you have someone like Michael Caine, (laughs) right? (laughs) Who can make, you know, the phone book sound like Shakespeare. Like he's just so talented uh, and he starts, you know, giving just very obvious uh, we're in the, the the car ride, you know, when we first meet him and this bus passes by and he literally just says out loud exactly what we're looking at. Illegal immigrants, you know, uh, they keep they keep sending them back over the border or whatever he says. It's but it's just right there flat. It's not like, you know, I'm sick of all the, the way they're treating illegal immigrants, you know, uh, we'll, and it's just back and forth. Nope. We're just going to say exactly what you just saw. Here it is. And because it's Michael Caine, he knows how to make it sound like it's coming out of his character instead of out of uh, uh, the, the screenplay. Right. It's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's hard. Like. I couldn't get away with that as an actor. I'm not that good. I'm not Michael Caine. I'm not, 
uh, you know, Denzel Washington who can just say words and suddenly it's just like, wow, yeah, you're right. <laughs> like yeah. I just, I literally just said my name, you know, and it just sounds really uh, informative. <laughs> yeah. That's really interesting. So uh, even in the clip that you played, you know, there's a lot of exposition there. Of- that's the, I would think that's the most clever exposition that he, he does in this yeah. film. And yet uh, it's still him just flat out, you know, telling his backstory. Well, part of it is also, you know, because of the decisions with the camera, like you mm-hmm. never go over to them. They're always in the background and he's just talking where we stay with Clive Owen with, with Theo, right. The whole time we never go into the living room where they're having the conversation. So it's almost like we're also, you know, in earshot, like listening in, you know, kind of like a fly on the wall, listening in like Theo is. Uh, and so it feels like, and Mike and Michael Caine's character, uh, I guess, uh, what Jasper is, mm. is giving that information to, to people. So we might as well receive it as well. You know, yeah. it's just a brilliant way, a brilliant way to do the exposition. Cause I hate exposition. Yeah. I would rather never be fed anything and just kind of like question everything. the whole time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but you're, you're right. There is a ton of it in here and I didn't even notice it. So we so, know. When you have the tools. And so I can imagine him as a director and writer, you know, being more and more comfortable with like, you know what? I have Michael Caine. Like at at some point, (laughs) you know, I have Sandra Bullock and I have George Clooney, right? Gravity. It's like, you know what? It's okay. I can, I can get a, I don't want to call it lazy, but I can get a little bit more obvious with my writing and trust my performers um, to naturalize it and make it feel just part of who they are as a character they'll figure it out um and if not uh we can have a conversation about what they need and they'll tell me i can trust them to tell me what they need because they're professionals they're not worried about you know being perfect and being this and that instead and man this has been one of my frustrations as a director i keep trying to have these relationships with my actors and uh i think there's just a a little bit of hesitation and fear of i don't want to take those risks yet um, and so I'm looking forward to, you know, working with people who not only are not afraid to take risks, but also know how to make it work, how to fail, regroup and have a, a successful thing. And I'm sure as a as a director, you know, he's just finally seeing I don't have to control everything. Mm-hmm. I'm working with incredible talent. You know what? How about I use their talent and I don't stress myself out all day? <laughs> I, I want to know when this quote was yes. <laughs> I know when he made that shift <laughs> before or after this film. Right. Oh man. Uh. Oh, fantastic. Thank you guys so much for joining us. I had a great time, Wes. Thank you for your insights. I think I learned a ton and, and I'm so glad we did this movie. Thank you for your, for your suggestion. Uh, who is it that suggested this? Seth. Seth. Thank you, Seth, very much. Uh, just opened my world like big time and I, I loved having this conversation uh yeah make sure you join us next week we're doing pan's labyrinth uh, share us with your friends as wes said and and subscribe and review us all of that stuff helps a ton uh hell even uh, join our patreon if you if you so de- so desire uh until next week i'm todd i'm wes go watch some movies